podcast today. We are looking forward to learn more about your life, your current roles, and your vision for the future. We hope that this session would serve as an inspiration for all of our participants who have joined us in this session today. So I guess just kicking off the bat, let's uh, get on to know about your personal career path. So many of us know you as this person who is in, who was in the medical field. I guess you still are. But you started off your career in medicine. What made you realize that your purpose was more than just being a great doctor in Malaysia? Well, first of all, thank you very much for inviting me. It's a good morning from Geneva here and good uh, good evening in Malaysia. Um, I think all my life, um, I never really decided that I was going to be a doctor, to be very honest. Uh, I think I'm more left brain, you know, in, in, equally left and right brain. I love the arts uh, and um, I probably, you know, as a child, uh, I lost my father to cancer at a very young age. I was only 10 um, when he was uh, diagnosed. And I think the going in and out of hospital kind of made me feel that, you know, I needed to be thinking of a career uh, where, you know, I could help others. And I think that's what drove me to the medical profession. But it was also because I realized that um, uh, I was actually enrolled to do engineering in the UK, uh, but I, I'm one of these people who has a great desire to connect with human beings and talk and you know socialize my ideas. I think engineering was not quite the profession for me, so I said, okay, let me stick to the medical profession. And um, I, I, I pursued a uh, postgraduate qualification in obstetrics and gynecology because of my very strong belief that women, uh, there were too few women um, uh, specialists in Malaysia, and uh, a lot of the demand from women was to actually have someone who they would feel comfortable with, uh, especially in Malaysia, there were so few female gynecologists and obstetricians. And you know, I, I love my job, I must say, I love being a doctor, I love interacting with people, but um, I did feel something was missing. Uh, I've always envisioned myself uh, to be with those who are the most vulnerable um, and, you know, moving from a teaching position in university to working in the public sector to then the private sector, uh, there was something missing and that's how I kind of moved towards uh, the humanitarian and development sector. I see uh, that's very, very insightful to kind of learn about the backstory and the history. Um, so I guess you did touch uh, a little bit on this already, but maybe could you uh, explain a little bit about how you got involved in humanitarian causes and maybe some of your first projects uh, when you got in that field? So it was in 1998. Uh, I was already a very established uh, medical professional. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I felt I needed to be with the most vulnerable. And at the time, there was a, a conflict ongoing in the Balkans. You know, you will remember that uh, Sarajevo, Kosovo. Um, and I was just watching this. And as a medical professional in Malaysia, you know, there's no such thing as taking a gap year. Uh, and this is something which I feel is, you know, needs to be changed, right? Um, I couldn't sort of take a year out to, to go out and work in the field, so to speak. Uh, it would affect everything from my, my, you know, registration as a specialist, my career path and so forth. So I had to wait till I was actually in my own private practice. And I was watching this, um, I, I, my son was then about five years old, and I was explaining to him about the war, and, you know, we, you could see women and children really hungry and, you know, suffering. And I kept telling him that, you know, this is the world that, you know, we must change, we must believe in peace, and we must work hard to protect peace. And that's also very important for me because I come from a very uh, multi-ethnic background. So I come from mixed parentage. Um, there's all sorts of, you know, faiths in my family. So, you know, I've always lived in a, an environment where we got along, right? We accepted each other's differences and, and we embraced this. So, you know, my son very innocently turned around to me and he said, well, you're a doctor. Why don't you do something about it? And he was absolutely right. So he kind of triggered, you know, what was already brewing in my head, you know, and um, and I said, OK, I'll do something about it. And 
I started to write to some Malaysian organizations to say, I would like to offer myself, you know, for six months to a year, no pay required. I will go out and take a year out and do, you know, my work in the, in the war zone. No one replied. I think at the time, you know, Malaysia was not quite in the humanitarian sector. At the same time, I must say, you will remember 98, 99 was the starting of the reformacy and the people were really, Malaysia was just generally angry, right? And, you know, people were fighting about their own ideologies. Families were being ripped apart, right? Because of their, their beliefs and their, their, their support to certain political leaders. And I felt very hurt by this. I wanted people to come and work together. So I had this crazy idea that maybe I should start my own organization and bring Malaysians from all walks of life to do humanitarian work, right? Go to where people need us and so that we learn to appreciate what you really have at home and and bring people together, irrespective of race or religion, that you know we can all come together and do good. I was also very troubled by the fact that we measure progress and development by, you know, the highways that we build, you know, the, the tall skyscrapers, they are important, you know, but surely being a developed nation means that you can think global and, you know, there's no limit to compassion and that, you know, we you are a developed person and a developed country when you actually can think about other people's needs. Now, this was the idealistic me in 1999, right? So I started Mercy Malaysia. Uh, I thought that there would be very few people who would be interested. You know, lo and behold, 5,000 people signed up, you know, in the time that I was leading. Doctors, you know, flew out with me to war zones and crisis uh, areas. I guess the rest is history. Um, it's probably one of the best things I ever did in my life in the sense that, you know, and as far as my career, really taking the knowledge that I have, and applying that um, to where, you know, uh, it was needed the most. All right. Uh, thank you very much, Tan Sui Jimila, for sharing with us some insights into your personal career path. I'm sure we would all like to know some of your personal attributes for success. So um, I would like to ask you, speaking of war earlier, as a human humanitarian, your work has definitely taken you right into like the hearts of war zones, such as the one in Iraq back in 2003, if you can recall that. Uh, I can't imagine what that is like. You probably had to deal with a lot of challenging and perhaps even like frightening situations. Do you have any stories to share from those times? And how do you remain mentally and emotionally strong in such trying circumstances? Thank you. I think that, first of all, I'll say that, you know, what qualities do you actually need to be not just a good humanitarian, I think a good person, right? I think, and a good leader. The first, I think, is to have humility, uh, to know that you, know, you alone are not going to achieve everything. It's about, you know, being able to build a team uh, and also to do that, you need to be able to be a good listener. Many leaders like to talk. Many leaders, you know, listen, uh, they listen to reply, not to listen to understand and to empathize and, you know, to have that humility to say, you know, here's an idea. Is that what you do you agree with me? And also encouraging people that you lead to not be afraid to disagree with you. Um, and, and I think, you know, that's one thing, you know, I had to grow up with. I, again, going back to childhood, which obviously had a huge impact on me. I come from a large family, you know, uh, our family is 13 siblings and I am number 13. So I remember as a young child, my parents used to say to me, you can't shout, your voice is too soft. You need to negotiate and you need to learn how to how to find, you know, ways to get what you want without, you know, trying to throw a tantrum or whatever. So I think, you know, have, and and to do that, I think I had to listen and watch and wait for the right moments to 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 negotiate, right? So I think being a leader is the same thing, you know, to be firm, but also to be humble and to to empathize and build a good team, and acknowledge everyone's success and their role in whatever success you get. Now, working in crisis areas means that you have to have double. Uh, the empathy and the humility. You know, I, I really must emphasize that a lot of the times, you know, even in Malaysia when there's a flood, people go in and they just give water, they give food, they give clothes. We're like asking people what they actually need. You know, we tend to give people what we think they need, not what they want. Um, and I think, you know, um, it's, it's a very important lesson because 
learning to communicate, learning to respect that even people in the most vulnerable situations have dignity that you know they need to be allowed uh, to to continue uh, to to have that dignity and charity is not a way to provide dignity so you know giving assistance is not about charity it's about social justice it's about doing the right thing because we all have the same you know i believe in human rights and i believe every human being has a right to live with dignity so I think if you come from that perspective, when you go in, it's easier to handle the situation. And I think if you're kind, people are people know, right? Sincerity is something that you don't show. You people feel, uh, you know, it's not something you can say. I'm sincere. No, it's the way you behave that people will know you're sincere. So in, I must say, you know, I've been through pretty harrowing situations. You know, you mentioned Iraq, as you know, I was shot in Iraq, you know, during all my work there, you know, and, um, you know, I've been in, you know, Afghanistan and Sudan and, you know, every single, you know, crisis you can imagine for the last, you know, 15, 20 years. But, you know, all the time when I go there, um, if you have that mindset and, you know, you have to be very strong, but you also have to know your limits. So I think self-awareness is another very important factor. Being able to know that, okay, I'm reaching a limit where I think I'm going to have a serious mental pressure now uh, and finding those outlets. So when I was running Mercy Malaysia, you know, we made sure everyone understood psychological first aid so that we would be able to even recognize it among our peers and then offer that, you know, say, take a break now, you need to go away. Uh, I cry a lot um, when I, when I, you know, I, I tend to be really, you know, I deeply empathize and I tend to cry and I think it helps me. I think cry, crying is not a sign of weakness. Uh, you know, it's, it's, um, it's a way that I cope, uh, but I cry quietly in the corner. Uh, but, you know, and, and I try to think through, you know, what what is going on, you know, how do I best address? And, and I said, having that self-awareness, knowing that you're close to that limit and getting help is, is very, very important. But having said all of that, you know, the kindest and the most generous people are the ones who have the least. And they will lift you, uh, you know, in every situation I've worked. You know, it's children and women and, you know, young people and men who have, you know, done small things. Uh, you know, even as I say, speak to you and I'm feeling quite emotional. Done little things that just, you know, sh truly show you that, you know, this is the right thing to do. And your presence means a lot to them, right? Uh, and I think that, you know, I think we've got to take all that and, you know, cry a lot, laugh a lot, you know, learn a lot. Uh, always, always, always be curious and want to learn because there's always something new uh, that that is out there that you don't know. So you're not an expert in all things, but, you know, you can be a expert learner of all things. Wow, wow, wow. wow. Those are some really, really interesting stories and so many different perspectives. Uh, all right, guys, so take note, it's okay to cry. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, moving on, uh, it's a more lighthearted question because the previous one, I'm also getting a little bit emotional by me. <laughs> so um, so uh, I was curious, so I just go through Twitter and I saw that you describe yourself as a farmer. So I'm really yeah. curious about that. <laughs> so, and then like, um, how does this on the surface, a very simple term to many people might have a significant meaning to you? Yeah, I think I have great admiration for farmers. You know, farmers put things into the ground, nurture the soil and the seed, and it turns into a beautiful uh, plant or tree or food, you know. I've always said that, you know, I hope, you know, my tombstone will read, I was a really good farmer, that I planted seeds for people to take shade under or to take comfort from. Um, and and as I worked in the humanitarian sector and as a doctor, you know, I realized that the way we behave as human beings, um, our behaviors have really impacted the world. So as you know, I now run, uh, or rather I manage uh, the Sunway Center for Planetary Health. It's because everything is linked. Because if you don't protect the environment, if you start behaving and consuming plastics galore, if you don't bring your water bottle to, to college and put water in without having to buy mineral water bot bottles in plastic, then we're all contributing to the complete, you know, 
destruction of our planet. And that's led us to a lot of things like the climate crisis, disasters. It's all linked, even conflict. You know, working in some parts in Africa, if you think about Burkina Faso, you know, where there's conflict, it's partly, it's, you know, driven by the fact that, you know, it's dry. People have no water to 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 do their farming, and therefore, you know, um, in many parts of Africa, people become, you know, pastoralists start moving and encroaching into other areas, and therefore, conflict and tensions ensue. So, you know, so I think the importance of planetary health and protecting this one planet is not just a, an environmental issue; it's an anthropogenic issue. It's about us. It's about human beings, our behaviors. And that, you know, it does have links to 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 health. Uh, we've seen, for example, the pandemic. It didn't arise out of the blue. It's because, you know, you've damaged the environment and therefore, you know, viruses jump from animal to animal and animal to humans. Uh, we have destroyed the environment. Therefore, we can't contain the water that falls down on from the skies and we get landslides and floods. Um, you know, you, you get all these problems because we have been greedy as human beings and development for us is an insatiable desire and appetite to just grow and buy. So, you know, so I think I call myself a farmer because now I stopped taking red meat. Uh, I have planted my own vegetables at home. I try to be self-sufficient, you know, and I have uh, some ducks and uh, so I get eggs. Um, so I think, you know, I think that the world now needs to shift, no matter whether you're an engineer or an architect or a, an actual scientist or a communications expert or business uh, you know, man, management uh, school. We all need to look at how does our career, our work, the things we learn, how do you put a planetary health lens in front of it? You know, how do you, as Harriet Waters, you know, become our leaders you know, that we need? that are more conscious about, you know, planetary health. So I think this is why, you know, I call myself a farmer. Well, well I would definitely have not thought of that. It's such interesting how simple terms can have very different meaning for every individual. And um, so, uh, uh, so it's interesting that you were the special advisor to the Prime Minister of Malaysia on public health in 2020, and now the executive director of Sunway Centre for Planetary Health. Perhaps, uh, can you share with us how planetary health differs from public health in simple terms and how sure. does it matter to use? Yeah, so public health generally is a term where it's about not treating individuals, right? If you go to a, a physician, uh, you know, if you have a headache, they'll treat the headache. But public health is about treating the entire public and community. So what measures do you take? Making sure that we have, um, you know, good clean water supply so people don't get cholera. Uh, making sure that you have good nutrition. Making sure that you have good infectious disease control. So public health is a, a broader perspective in taking care of the entire community uh, uh, and, and, and so forth. Now, planetary health is very different. Planetary health acknowledges that for us to be healthy, the health of the planet needs to be as good as our health. And if our health, our planet is not healthy, it will have impact on our health. So the difference is there, major difference there. Uh, and and that, you know, it's all intrinsically, you know, linked, right? And therefore, um, you know, what in simple terms is that we cannot have human health without planet health. I hope that's clear. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's that's really clear. And I think it's uh, beautifully put as well, uh, Dr. Jamila. And uh, yeah, so moving on, I, I would like to hear more about sustainability and especially being an engineer myself, that's always at the forefront of uh, engineering development. So, of yeah. course, uh, sustainability is a word that's on many people's lips these days. So it was definitely interesting to hear about planetary health just now. Uh, maybe you could tell us something about the Center of Planetary Health based at Sunway University and what do you hope to achieve within the next five years? 
Okay, so first of all, um, the word sustainability means that how do we progress without doing damage, right? Uh, and I think that we look at it from three aspects, people, planet, profit, right? so the three Ps. So you may have also heard a new term in the business school called ESG, environmental, social, and good governance. These are all components to actually driving uh, sustainability because if we keep doing business, if we keep developing uh, in a way that does not take into account these factors, it, it, we will be leading ourselves to self-destruction. So this is how self-sustainability came on. So in 20, uh, let me remember the year, 2015, I think our, the leaders of uh, the United Nations came together and said, we need to have an ambition uh, for sustainability. And that's how the sustainable development goals came up with. Yeah? And that was a very consultative process where uh, 17 goals were uh, agreed upon. There's lots, you know, from er eradicating poverty to water to, you know, life on the sea, climate change. And the 17th goal, which is, I think, the most crucial one, is about partnership. So they then decided that there will be some indicators beneath each of these goals that we need to meet, almost like your KPIs, right? You need to have a certain a standard, uh, a, a, um, a benchmark for you to achieve. So that's the 17 sustainable development goals. And they, the, the aim is that we achieve sustainable development, these sustainable uh, goals by 2030. Now, you and I know that we will not achieve it because uh, of so many things, right? The goals themselves are ambitious. The world ha is full of inequ inequity. Uh, we have seen this with the pandemic, you know, vaccine inequity. Um, the pandemic itself has, you know, shifted economies backwards. And uh, there's a lot of losses uh, in the last two years that will actually impact countries to be able to even bounce back. So, so this is why um, you know, uh, it, it, it's so important. And planetary health is the area above it. I mean, so you, you, it's the underlying drivers of why we are not sustainable. Now, if you're an engineer, what it means is that how do you build something or have a develop a system that will allow you to achieve your final goal? For example, you want to build a car, but that car is not going to emit so much carb CO2, carbon dioxide, that we're going to damage the uh, planet further, right? So we know now there are, you know, electric cars. Um, there are, you know, cars now running on biofuels, uh, you know, uh, fuels and so on and so forth. Um, but I think that the most important thing is a shift in systems thinking, right, about, you know, this is why the planetary health angle, the planetary health lens angle that I mentioned earlier, when you put, you know, yourself in front of whatever you're doing, how is this doing, what is the impact of what I'm doing on the planet, what is the impact that I'm doing on the social fabric of society? What is it doing on the economic perspective? So all these things that you need to put in place. So even if you were a, um, let me give another example, if you're a business person, right, since you're in business, all right, Ang, so, you know, if I'm going to do business and I'm going to do entrepreneurship, can I be an entrepreneur who actually looks at, you know, profit through a sustainable lens, for example, a circular economy or, you know, uh, 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 upcycling, recycling, uh, how do I, uh, you know, and young people are excited about these things. These are things that, you know, young people I know are more passionate about because they, they realize, you know, they're the ones who are inheriting this terrible planet that, you know, uh, our forefathers and ourselves have, have destroyed. So, so, you know, that's basically what, what sustainability is all about, looking at the three angles of people, planet, profit uh, from the different, uh, you know, wherever you are looking at uh, from. Yeah, that's very, very insightful, uh, doctor. Uh, can I, and, can uh, I, John, uh, so you asked me about Sunway. So Sunway University is a new university, is a young university. Uh, it is a non-profit university. It uh, it has the leadership is passionate and committed to sustainability. So if you come to Sunway campus, you will not see plastic bottles uh, at all. 
Uh, there are water dispensers everywhere. The, you do not see straws. You know, the, the, the students are really committed, and there's reminders everywhere that you can't do certain things. So now that I've established the planetary health center, they have taken it a step further. They have now decided that Sunway will be a university that approaches uh, planetary health as an overarching umbrella. So um, therefore, from 2024, if you enroll in in Sunway, you will be uh, expected to do a mandatory course on planetary health with a seven, it's a seven week course, uh, which is planetary health or community service, which means that how do you apply your knowledge um, uh, to, to, to advance planetary health? So we recently had a pilot uh, with a communication school. So we put them into seven areas. And uh, for example, they're looking at uh, how do you have um, a planetary health diet, right? A diet that's actually good for the planet and good for you. How do you have, so I have a little cooking show now called Planet Saving Meals, it's on YouTube. Um, and, and you know, um, and, I, and we do things, for example, like uh, how do you look at uh, communicating and countering uh, misinformation about the climate or environment or COVID or whatever. So all these things, because I said, are so interlinked. So, you know, um, so we're very excited about this. I'm very excited. It's the first university in the world to do it. Uh, my plan is to have the, the material open source so that any university can take it and apply it. Uh, and hopefully, you know, we can encourage the institutions of higher learning to, you know, produce young leaders who will be conscious uh, of their role uh, on you know protecting the future generations and also you know being able to do well and lead uh, with with you know this 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 value set that is so important yeah i mean about sunway university i was actually doing my a levels there a few years ago and i can definitely attest to the fact that uh, you cannot see a single like plastic bottle, for example. And I remember everyone were using metal straws. So definitely, I think Sunway is is, is uh, taking the right steps towards that direction. And uh, yeah, so the Center of Planet Planetary Health has five priority teams. And one of it that I'm really interested to talk about is uh, to achieve sustainable food systems. So as we know, uh, the Earth has enough resources for everyone to feed everyone but the problem is often that we don't really have the uh, capability or at least not for now to develop food systems for that food to reach people so i'm curious as to some of the actionable steps being taken uh, by the center towards that direction yeah, that's a really important question. So thank you for that. Well, first of all, when we talk about food systems, it's not just about food security, that is producing enough food for people, which by the way, we are insecure today. Uh, there isn't enough food uh, for the world. Uh, and the second is the food systems itself. There is wastage of food, right? So let's start with food security. Climate change has driven a lot of uh, problems uh, about uh, food security. You know, as I mentioned earlier, in parts of the world, uh, there's not enough water uh, to plant, uh, uh, you know, uh, food to, to grow food. Um, in some uh, parts of the world, obviously, uh, you know, there's a problem with. Um, conflict, for example, in Ukraine, right? It's a food basket for Europe. So it's created a lot of insecurity because food cannot be exported out. So um, so one way we can look at food security is that you need to actually put agriculture and food security as a top priority in terms of policy, right? Because you have to feed your people. So I'm calling, I'm, I'm speaking to you from Switzerland where you know, food security is so important. So even though, you know, far, uh, farmers here are quite heavily subsidized so that the country can be self-sufficient, that they will have enough grain, they'll have enough food and all that. Um, and at the same time, lots of innovation is required because you don't really need, how do you produce food with the lowest amount of water uh, that's required, right? So you've heard about vertical farming. Singapore, for example, right? It doesn't have that much land, but it's food secure. You know what it's done is actually bought land, right? In other parts of the world 
and started planting food for their own country. So, so, so that that aspect of food security is important. But until and unless we actually look at the climate crisis very, very seriously, we will be in this vicious circle continually. Now, food systems is also about the the logistics, right? How you transfer food from one place to the other, and how do you uh, avoid food going to the landfill? Now, I'll I'll give you some really scary data, which really frightens me. 45% of the food in the landfill that arrives in the landfill is still edible. If we take the food that you can rescue from a landfill, you can feed 12 million people three meals a day in Malaysia. Now, it, this is terrible. It's in my article for the Star this month. So what do I do? I don't want to talk about the people. What do I do? The first thing is that, you know, you do a shelf fee, right? You want to go to the supermarket, you take a picture in your, your refrigerator and see what's actually in it. So that, you know what, you, you, you have a tendency, especially when you, you go shopping, to say, oh, I think I need that. But you don't realize actually you already have a bottle of something already in the fridge. Or, to, you know, buy what you need and buy not in bulk. Buy it when you need it. Um, I grow my own food. Uh, so, you know, even if you're staying in a flat, you know, it's not impossible to have a little pot, you know, of kangkong or whatever. It's, it's so easy to grow in Malaysia, right? Put anything in the soil, it grows. The second thing is that I have a philosophy at home that anything organic doesn't leave my home. So I compost. So whatever that's, I have ducks. So I feed my ducks. My ducks get really good vegetables um, and whatever leftovers that we have. Um, you know, so we have a compost and that compost goes back to the earth and therefore I have really fantastic healthy vegetables. So, so you know, thinking about food systems in that way is not just about production. It's also about avoiding you know, it going to the landfill because when it goes to the landfill, it becomes methane, right? It produces methane. Then you're adding more greenhouse gases to, to the world. And then food systems is also about food systems you're looking at equity in getting food. You know, right now there's a serious food crisis in many parts of Africa. People are starving. Nobody should starve in the 21st century, right? So how then do we look at, you know, again, as an engineer, uh, as a business person, uh, you know, how what kind of innovations now are required from from you know uh, from all of us uh, to rethink uh, food systems? It, the rate we're going, we need one and a half more Brazils uh, to grow enough food for the country, uh, for the for the world. So you know, we have to now rethink that, right? Um, if you go to Singapore again, uh, you will see that every little area, square area, and I mean. Every community will have a community garden. So at least, even if it doesn't feed everyone, it starts building the mindset that you know, food is precious, food can be grown, food should not be wasted. Uh, in in Europe now, in Switzerland now, if you walk around, they don't cut, cut the grass anymore. So you see the, the grass and the wildflowers growing. Why? Because they want the pollinators to come back. So the bees and the insects and so forth. It's really nice, but this is rethinking the food systems, right? Yeah, uh, I think that's honestly very, very insightful. Um, I've never really had, uh, I mean, I've I've looked into like food systems and stuff and no one on the internet at least have uh, has ever quite explained it the way you did. So I think that's really, really, you're really, uh, the center is definitely starting like a really interesting conversation when it comes to sustainability in, in foods. Um, so, Recently, you have recently joined Harriet Watt University, Malaysia as our first pro-chancellor. Our chairman, Dato Yasmin Mahmood, said your passion, dedication and proven leadership track record will advance our university's mission of delivering world-class purpose-led education. Please share some of your vision for Harriet Watt University, Malaysia and how you can guide us to greater accomplishments. Well, first of all, it's such an honor to be the pro chancellor uh, of a university that I really admire. And I don't say this because I'm just a pro chancellor. It, it took me a long time to agree to to be the pro chancellor. I did a lot of homework and reading. Uh, I'm a real feminist, so I believe that you know Harriet Watt has the right principles about equality and 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 you know the fact that it was the first university in the UK to admit women. You know, is really something that I truly admire. I also think that you know. The, the leadership, uh, you know, when I was in Edinburgh, certainly I saw that the commitment to actually producing high quality value, purpose, values and purpose um, led 
you know, individuals, right, uh, is, is something that is really admired because truly education is about educating the whole person. I mean, if I can go take five steps back, the children in primary school today, 65% of children in primary school will work in jobs that don't even exist today. So what are we teaching? We need to be teaching values. We need to be teaching the ability for them to collaborate, uh, to communicate, uh, to network, because so much information can be gotten off the internet right now, right? Um, uh, and, and I must say, I mean, I apologize to my my son because when when he was younger, he kept watching YouTube, and I couldn't understand why are you watching YouTube until he said to me. I'm learning, you know, and then I realized that, you know, my generation didn't have that, but your generation does. So, so what do we then want to teach children and young people in schools and universities? It must be about values, finding your purpose. How are you going to impact the world? What is your impact statement? You know, what will, I always tell people, what will your tombstone read? Right. Well, how will people remember you? You don't have to be remembered as a hero, but as at least someone who treaded gently on earth and, and you know, didn't harm anyone or whatever. But, you know, those values are so important. So I really hope, you know, and, and uh, in Malaysia, as you know, it's competitive, right, to find a job and so forth. But if I'm looking for someone to hire. I want people who have values, people who can communicate, uh, people who are, you know, able to have an open mindset to learn, uh, to be able to 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 collaborate. You know, I do hope that you know Herod Watt University will continue to champion you know values and purpose-led education, but also you know very importantly is to also look at you know how do we develop the skill sets for young people to cope with a very uncertain world. So that will require, you know, a lot of um, uh, ability for young people to think outside the box, uh, to be able to continually look for innovations in everything that they do. Interesting. Yeah, I can definitely say that uh, Harry Webb really passed on these values despite only studying a few years. Oh, so, uh, thank you, Doctor. We would like to have some time to open up for some general questions from our audience. But before we do, uh, can, we, can I ask you one final question, please? All right. uh, so, your passion and commitment perfectly demonstrate that if you really want to have a positive impact in the world, then there are no boundaries. What is your final message to the Harawad students who might be thinking about what their own pathway to purpose might look like? Well, my advice is that only you and you alone know what you're passionate about and what you want in life, right? And the rest of us around you will guide you. If you really believe in something, ask yourself, you know, why do you believe in it? Is it because it's, uh, you know, the, the fashionable thing to do? Or is it something that you think you can persist? And and I think you've got to you start charting, you know, and having a vision, right? Always have a vision of where you want to be and why. The second thing I will advise you is that it's okay to change your vision. I started as a doctor. I became a humanitarian. Uh, as a doctor, I was also teaching in medical school. Um, I then worked in high-level policy at the UN and, and the International Federation, and I'm back to becoming a teacher again, right? And uh, and and, uh, but not just a teacher, but a connector. You know, trying to inspire others to rethink, right? Uh, how they do work and how they do business and how they, um, uh, you know, govern a country or govern an agency or an organization. So the advisory policy work that I do right now, but at the same time. You know, I never imagined the young Jamila in school who was mischievous as hell, I will tell you this. My headmistress is still alive. She's 97 or 98. Um, but she will tell you that, you know, I was the one who was always on the stage wanting to be a, 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 um, a concert pianist and a drama, tr drama you know, actor because uh, that's how much I love the arts. Um, I never imagined that I would take this path. But along the way, I found, you know, always I'm always curious so always be curious you know always want to um, you know always want to do something if you feel that oh this is something I really want to do I'm not an environmentalist but I do feel 
very passionately about the planet because I feel guilty. I feel that I have contributed to the damage of the planet, right? So I'm finding ways now on how I can inspire others to really rethink, you know, our relationship with the planet. So it's okay to change your mind as well. Uh, while it's good to focus and have a vision, but when you've got or you achieve something, it's okay to move on to the next uh, exciting thing. Thank you, Doctor, for the fascinating conversation. Uh, now we would like to select some questions from the audience. So uh, uh, the first, uh, any questions? Are there lots of questions in the chat? <clears throat> there are quite a few questions in the chat. Anil's going to ask uh, the first question. All right. Um, I think this is definitely a question which I personally uh, have been kind of wondering myself. So this question is asked by, I believe, Dr. Menaka Ganesan. So my question is, weddings are the one of the major contributors to food waste in Malaysia. What is your point of view and what are the ways to educate uh, the community on this? Yeah, I think that we have to do a lot more advocacy and, and, and engagement and educating the public around food waste, not just wedding. Look at Ramadan. Uh, Ramadan had the highest amount of food waste in the history of Malaysia, the last one. Because I think people were just suddenly let loose and went crazy, right? So so I think that's one. Uh, you know, reflect on the pandemic. People still got married. There were smaller weddings. They were more intimate. You know, um, you don't need to have major, you know, sort of expenditure. The third is there are cultures where, you know, uh, you come in and you're actually given uh, food to take away. So uh, in Indonesia, for example, you know, they, they come for weddings, you know, you're given, you can eat a little, but you're given your little portion to take away. In the Malay culture, this was actually happening in the Javanese kind of, you know, uh, uh, ethnic groups, right? They, they, they call it nasi ambang, you know, they eat on a common plate and then they take away for the family. So I think we've got to go back to traditional practices, right? And, and, and think about how do you, and I think if you tell people that, um, you know, we don't want you to waste. Or if you're organizing a wedding and you already tie up with the charity to say that whatever leftovers, can you come and pick it up and feed the, you know, people who are hungry or poor or whatever. Uh, but nothing in excess, right? Uh, but, no, I, I have two sons. I tell them when they get married, uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of money throwing a lavish wedding. I'd rather give them the money so that they can buy a house or, you know, something to set, set start their life, right? Uh, I think that you know, changing that mindset that weddings are actually a celebration of love, not a celebration of food. Um, uh, that you know, it is a time where you come to celebrate the love and union of two people. Um, and you know, and I think stop living up to the Joneses, right? Trying to to say that you have to do this because you know you are. You know, if I had to live up to the Joneses within whatever you know, honorific titles that I have, you know, I'd be depressed, right? I am what I am. I take public transport. I do whatever I want. I eat on a side street. I don't care, you know, because you know, at the end of the day, you have to be true to yourself. All right. Nice. Uh... So uh, we have a second question from the audience is climate change is a reality. Do you foresee food shortages in Malaysia and what can we what can be done to reduce the risk? Yeah, so I mentioned that quite in detail. I think the problem is not just food shortages, it's food security because of cost. Right. People will. There's already a problem in Malaysia, right? For the poor, they are eating, but they're not eating nutritious food. Right. There are a lot of young people don't even eat vegetables. So, you know, uh, and because of climate change, the quality of our rice and grain is actually lower and therefore you get carbohydrates without the real micronutrients that you actually need. So one of my friends who was doing the study was telling me, you know, at the end of the day, we get children who are fatter, but not so clever because they don't get the micronutrients to nourish their brain. So I think, you know, there's so many it, it, this, this requires, you know, a, a long conversation. But yes, food security will be an issue not because of also not just because of the amount of food, but also the price of food uh, is going to go up. It's already gone up, right, because of the conflict and so forth. So, um, you know, how then do we do we educate people about you know not just consum consumption but also the quality of consumption? Uh, it's easy for you and me to say this because we have enough money to buy food. 
But for those who are struggling, you know, the B40 and so forth, for so forth, I think we've got to think about, you know, how do they get access food? Now, if I had my way, I would like every B40 housing co uh, project uh, to have their own community farm, right? And to build vertical farms. Imagine those very ugly, you know, uh, public housing that we have for the poor. Imagine if you cover the entire, you know, facade with just, you know, vertical gardens, right? That they could pluck vegetables off their 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 balcony or their walls, um, you know, and and actually it will also look good. So I mean, we've got to rethink what the city city development look like uh, in the future, which is why you know um, safe and healthy cities are also part of the work that we're doing uh, at Sunway, and we will be announcing very very soon a very exciting project uh, that we're going to turn one city into a donut city. Uh, and I have no time to explain, but Google donut city. City Amsterdam, and we're going to build a city like that in Malaysia. All right, all right. We are reaching towards the end of today's event, and so we don't have time for any more questions. If you're a student at Harvard University Malaysia and you would like to claim Empower points for participating in today's session, please head over to the Empower SharePoint to claim 10 megawatts of points. Tap under People Skills. You can get the QR code from the meeting chat, which will take you right there. Don't forget to capture proof of your participation. Now I hand okay. over to Andy to say a few some, words. Yeah, I saw some really good questions in the chat, which I feel is unfair for me not to answer. So could you email them to me, and I will be very happy to answer them on email, and you can share. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's yes. that's possible. I agree. There's a lot of uh, good questions being good asked. Questions in the chat. But uh, unfortunately, due to time constraint, uh, this would mark the end of our session, everyone. So thank you very much, uh, Tansri, for taking time out of your very busy schedule and to share experience with us. Uh, and obviously, thank you to all of our audience for joining. We hope that you have enjoyed today's session. So now I'll pass the floor back to Professor Deborah for some closing remarks. Thank you, Anil. And I have to say a sincere thanks to Dr. Jamila for a fascinating hour's conversation. I really enjoyed it. We covered so much um, <laughs> and it was really inspiring. And thank you for agreeing to answer the, the other questions that have come from our audience. So, so thank you for giving up some time in your very busy schedule. Um, I also wanted to express my sincere thanks to our two amazing MCs. They've done a fantastic job. Thank you, YJ and Anil. You're um, uh, yeah, a great uh, asset to the university and you've, you've been fantastic in making this evening with sessions so enjoyable. I'm really proud of you both. And I know it's not so easy leading a conversation with one of Malaysia's top female leaders, but you seem so at ease and have lots of self-confidence. So you're great positive role models for the rest of our students. Um, if you've enjoyed today, um, then let me remind you that we've got another one of these conversations coming up on the 15th of July, when we will be talking with uh, Professor Heather McGregor who's currently the Executive Dean of the Business School in Edinburgh um, and our incoming Provost at the Dubai campus. Um, we'll be celebrating World Youth Skills Day uh, with Heather on the 15th of July, and that promises to be another fascinating conversation. Do look out for uh, registration um, in our Facebook or Instagram and on email. Um, but on behalf of Harriet Watt University Malaysia, thank you for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Tansri. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.